people have to say to me, you know, how do you keep from getting profoundly depressed on spending so much time in, in these inner city schools in the poorest neighborhoods? And I always say, actually, the place I get really depressed is Washington. When I go to Washington, D.C., I always leave there feeling horrible. I always feel, um, I always feel depressed because everybody in power, even the people who really are fond of me, will say, you know, these things take time, Jonathan, be patient. Like concerning the Brown decision, they say, be patient, these things take a while. Concerning preschool for little children, they've been saying this for 40 years. Be patient, someday, someday we'll, we'll give all those little kids the wonderful preschool they deserve. And, you know, it, it makes me so angry. Don't, don't, don't listen to anybody older who tells you to be patient about social justice issues. You know, because... Because patience, patience on these kinds of issues is the luxury of people who are not in pain. For people who are in pain, it's an, it's an intolerable injustice because, you know, they say to me, I mean, even my allies on Capitol Hill, for years I used to go and testify in front of Senate committees, they'd say, Jonathan, someday we're gonna give Head Start and good, wonderful, early developmental education to all the little kids you write about. Uh, and some of the senators or congressmen have come up to meet the kids I've written about. And, um, you know, and they always say how adorable they are, but that's not good enough, you know? That's not good enough to give them hugs. Because um, you've got to keep faith with them when you're not giving them hugs, when you're at a distance, when you're wielding power. And they'll say on Capitol Hill, you know, in these hearings which I used to do, I call them uh, like the penultimate boring C-SPAN hearings, you know those things? Um, yeah, they, they say, you know, be patient, someday we'll give this to these kids. And I say, you know, someday isn't good enough for children who are three years old today, because they will never be three years old again. There are some forms of theft where we can make good later on for people who've, who've been robbed. Your car is stolen, there's a chance you can get it back, right? The house is vandalized, there's a chance court can get, get you reimbursed someday. But who can give back the third year of life to a little girl, the fourth year of life, the fifth year of life to, to a little kid? Uh, this is the irreversible theft. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. So that's why I'm not patient any longer. And uh, so I get depressed in Washington, but I actually, when I go into the schools, once, you know, while I'm there with the kids themselves, especially the little kids, I usually feel, I usually feel stirred by the possibilities that I see within them especially when I'm with the little ones. My last book is mostly about, uh, my latest book is mostly about kids who are still only six or seven or eight years old, and they haven't been damaged yet, or if they have, it's not apparent, and they, they're not hard. Most of the kids, I mean, they're not all perfect little babies, and I don't romanticize them and, you know, say they're all little angels, because some of them can drive me up the wall, to be honest. But, I mean, all kids, you know, I think poor kids have equal rights with rich kids to be obnoxious. And, um, but, but um, you know, they're not like poster children for the poor, but in their multitude of personalities, these kids are pretty much like children everywhere at this age. They're gentle children by and large. They're kind, unfailingly to strangers. And they always worry about older people. They worry about me far more than I can worry about them. Uh, this little boy, Mario, whom I've written about in um, two of my books, first time I ever met him, uh, I said, how old are you, Mario? This was in a church, in an after-school program, an Episcopal church. I said, how old are you, Mario? He says, I'm six, how old are you? You know how they do that. I said, I'm 60. He immediately, he immediately started stroking my hand. <laughs> 
you know, like that. With, and the little child's hand is very soft. And I kept stroking my wrist like that. And he looked up at me and said, oh, Jonathan, I hope you're not going to die. Because <laughs> it sounds like, 60 sounds like, by like 280 to him. And uh, then he ran to tell the priest how old I was, because I needed immediate attention, you know. And he ran to tell his grandma, who was in the kitchen of the church. And I, I've seen him behave that way with other older people, too. I've seen a lot of them behave that way. Of all the grown-ups I brought with me, the one who meant the most to that community, at least to the kids, and probably to the teachers, and I, I guess to their parents and grandparents, too, was someone I bet every one of you would love to spend a day of your life with, if it were still possible. Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, who was in New York. He said, I'd like to meet the kids in your last book. Uh, and he said, it was such a modest man, he says, do you think I'd be intimidating to them? <laughs> no, I think they can. I think they can handle it, you know. So, and he said, "How do you usually go?" And I said, well, "I usually go on the train, number six train, which is the quickest way." Um, he said, "Okay, let's go on the train, on the subway." You know, there's no, there's no trolley in New York, so he went to the subway. Um, I, I didn't. I was sort of excited. I felt like a little kid myself. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you feel excited? I was sitting there thinking, "Wow." I get to think like, wow, I, I'm on the New York subway with Mr. Rogers, you know. And we went up to the Bronx and went up to a rough neighborhood at that time, Brook Avenue, which was the center of all the drug trade, uh, crack cocaine trade at that, at that moment. Um, and uh, we were just walking up the street together and I worried. I thought maybe no one would know who he is, you know. But nonsense. A, a, um, Sanitation truck came screeching to a halt. The driver was a 50, 60 year old black man, jumped out and lifted Mr. Rogers off the ground. And then we went to the public school, and I always try to do that in order to pay respect to the teachers who have been in the trenches all these years. Because it meant something to them to have Fred Rogers come to their classroom. And you can bet he didn't ask them anything about their test scores, you know. Uh, he just asked about the children. And then we went to the church, the after-school program, and it was packed. Mario spots Mr. Rogers right away. Well, you know, little kids don't like you. They can make it awful clear, you know? They can be mean. They can, uh, but if, if and, the, and he was like that, he could just walk away from you. But if he likes you, you're in for it. And as soon as he sees Mr. Rogers, he, he goes straight across the room, sort of like a a World War II attack plane. That's how I thought of this. Wings spread wide. The minute of collision, he wraps them around, Mr. Rogers. Kisses him on the forehead, looks him right in the eyes, and says, welcome to my neighborhood, Mr. Rogers. And um, Fred Rogers never forgot that.